Our very esteemed speaker for today is uh, Professor Amit Rahul Bashir, about a very significant uh, aspect in Arunhati Roy's latest fiction, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. And to officially welcome, to formally welcome uh, Professor Bashi and to extend our heartfelt gratitude to him for consenting to be part of this lecture, I would call upon our principal, Dr. Mohammad Riaz, to uh, speak and to greet uh, the audience and to welcome uh, him on behalf of our institution. Over to Thank you, Riaz. Basu. Thank you, Basu. <laughs> Evad, good evening to everyone. Honorable Speaker, Amit Rahul Bashe, Associate Professor, Department of English, University of Oklahoma, Dr. S. M. Yahya Ibrahim, Head of the Department of English, Karim City College, Academician, all faculty members, and my dear students. I am proud to welcome Amit Sas, Professor Bashe, who has consented to speak to us on a very significant issue in Arunanthi Roy's latest work of fiction. On behalf of the Karim City College management, I express my deep gratitude to our speaker for taking time out of their busy schedule to talk to academics and our students and share their love of reading and writing with us. The Department of English, Kareem City College, Jamshedpur has organized a web interaction on a foothold in the sheer wall of the future. Our speaker is well-known expert in his field of learning and whose knowledge will definitely enrich our students and present today among us is a matter of immense pride, not only for the Department of English, but also for Jamshedpur and far of Jharkhand as a whole. I also take this opportunity, opportunity to congratulate Professor M. Yahya Ibrahim, head of the Department of English, for organizing this symposium and bringing the word of such an admirable academics to us. I extend my best wishes to Dr. Neha Tiwari, Dr. Basudra Rai, Professor A.K. Das, Professor Saket Kumar, all faculty members and its students for a dynamic learning session ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Bashu, your mic. Bashu. Basu? Basu? I think she is unable to hear us. Sir. Yeah, yeah. You... Wait a minute, sir. Just a minute, sir. I'm call her. Saket, you continue. Kar lo. Saket, please continue. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, well, welcome, sir. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, uh, we, we have been eagerly uh, waiting for your deliberation today. And, sir, the platform is all yours. Sir, uh, you have to mute your mic, sir. You have to unmute your mic. Your mic, mic is muted. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much uh, <coughs> for inviting me. Um, it's indeed a great honor to be invited like this and to, to interact with people. This has been my eighth interaction over Google Meet or Zoom this year. So 
I hope things like this can continue because it's a good way to actually reach people in India and Pakistan and, and Bangladesh as well. Okay, um, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I will begin, of course, by talking a little bit about my interests, my current interests, uh, which are in the field of the Anthropocene. And I'd like to begin by, first of all, defining that term before I get uh, to, to Arundhati Roy's novel, which I'm reading as a kind of instance of um, a particular aspect of the Anthropocene, right? Now, the word Anthropocene was first coined, I mean, although there are precedents of this earlier in 2000 by the geologist, by the chemist, sorry, by the atmospheric chemist, uh, Paul Crudzen. And he used this to propose a name for a new geological epoch where the human species has become kind of like the dominant force, the dominant, almost like the non-human force affecting the world system, right? So the way of thinking about this Anthropocene is to say that this is a new geological, it's a controversial term, not everyone accepts it, but it's a way of thinking, for instance, about a new geological epoch where the human species impacts the world system as a whole. And it's most kind of common way of thinking about it is of course, uh, the question of climate change and the rising seas and so on, right? <clears throat> but there's one other factor of, I mean, that, of, among the many other factors of the Anthropocene, the other one which has actually gradually started getting a lot of attention is what is called the sixth great mass extinction event. Now, what people say is that we are currently, and this of course, when you think about geological time scales, you're not thinking about 10 years, you're not thinking about 20 years, you're thinking over a larger scale of time, right? 500,000 years or so on and so forth, right? But what we are in the middle of right now is what they call the sixth great extinction event. And primarily these extinctions have been caused by anthropogenic factors, which is uh, factors kind of influenced by, by questions of human activity. So it's in this line that I would like to read Ministry of Utmost Happiness as uh, a novel which is about species extinction, but which uses species extinction as a, as a kind of metaphor to read the condition of India in the present. But before I go on to the novel, let me just talk about two brief ways in which humanity scholars have often kind of approached the sixth great extinction event. The first way, of course, comes from a framework of knowledge which is gradually being called extinction studies based largely out of Australia. People like Tom Van Duren, you have people, for instance, like Matthew Cherlu, who talk about writing extinction tales with a kind of openness and accountability to non-human others. And in here, what they do, of course, is that they kind of foreground the, the question of non-human others, animals that are gradually getting extinct and so on and so forth. There's a second way in which extinction is often read, and this has been read by the critic uh, Ursula Heise, and I'm gonna read out a little bit from her. And she says that diver biodiversity, endangered species and extinction are primarily cultural issues, questions of what we value and what stories we tell, and only secondarily issues of science. What she's of course saying is that the scientific issues are of course important, but these are also biocultural issues. These are also cultural issues because what stories we tell about animals that disappear in a way also tells us about certain things that we value and that are disappearing as well. Moreover, as she says, extinction narratives show some crucial ways in which animals are cultural tools and agents in humans thinking about themselves, their communities, their histories, and their futures. So it is in this second camp, not so much in terms of extinction studies that privileges, let's say, you know, the, the lives of non-humans at, at, the, at the forefront and the center, but rather this second one, where we use this question of extinct animals as a way to talk about human values, which I'm going to foreground in this particular reading. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint here. Um, and what I'll do, of course, is read out certain sections from the PowerPoint from time to time. Uh, can all of you see the PowerPoint? Is the PowerPoint visible to everyone? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Is the PowerPoint visible to everyone? Can you see the PowerPoint? No, sir. Please share your screen. No, 
Uh, no, sir, it's not eligible. Oh, it's not yet, right? Just give me one second, please. I'm just. Uh, I haven't actually clicked the share button as yet. Okay, can you see it now? Sorry, I'm doing this for the first time here on. Uh, no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Excellent. Sorry, a little bit of a technical glitch because I'm not presented uh, with my uh, with a PowerPoint on this one. So let me begin with the epigraphs from my essay. Right, the first epigraph comes from the British critic John Berger's Wild Look at Animals. And it's a deceptively simple statement. He says, everywhere animals disappear. And then this is my favorite quotation from the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. And this is what Roy says, to be present in history, even as nothing more than a chuckle, was a universe away from being absent from it, from being written out of it altogether. A chuckle could become a foothold in the sheer wall of the future. As you can see, the title of my presentation comes from this quotation itself. So these are the epigraphs from my essay. I would begin though with um, <clears throat> with Ministry of Utmost Happiness, but with a quotation from another South Asian novel. This is from Mohsin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist. A curious passage occurs in Mohsin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist when the narrator is describing Lahore. He writes, Lahore was home to even larger creatures of the night back then. Flying foxes, my father used to call them. And when we drove along Mall Road in the evenings, we would see them hanging upside down from the canopies of the oldest trees. They are gone now. It is possible that like butterflies and fireflies, they belong to a dreamier world and incompatible with the pollution and congestion of a modern metropolis. Today, one glimpses them only in the surrounding countryside. Suffused with a, a Bulgarian melancholia as evidenced in my first epigraph, Everywhere Animals Disappear, this passage wistfully looks back to an older or dreamier Lahore, where forms of multi-species existence thrived, but the imperatives of modernization, signaled here by pollution and congestion, means that everywhere in a new metropolis, animals disappear. Berger's deceptively complex comment about <coughs> gestures towards the physical and cultural marginalization of animals during the period of modernity. Although the examples he chooses are largely Euro-Western in provenance and does not quite fit South Asia directly, there's an element of correctness in his identification of the growth of productive inventions and the instrumental mindset that they engender as the sources that are the root of this double marginalization of animals. This point comes out clearly in a following passage, which I quote from Why Look at Animals. During the 20th century, the internal combustion engine displaced drought animals in, in streets and, and factories. Cities, growing at an ever-increasing rate, transformed the surrounding countryside into suburbs where field animals, wilder domesticated, became rare. <coughs> the commercial exploitation of certain species, bison, tigers, reindeer, has rendered them almost extinct. Such wildlife as remains is increasingly confined to national parks and green reserves. And in fact, one could say that while in Indian cities or in Pakistani cities or in Bangladeshi cities, for instance, we do see a lot of animals still in city spaces. One aspect about the modernization or one aspect of what you could call the neoliberalization of city space is the gradual disappearance, of course, of animals from the sphere of everyday life. <clears throat> so Berger's statement also prophetically points, out, points towards the sixth great extinction event ongoing in the Anthropocene. Simultaneously, it is a melancholic appraisal of what the Native American critic Robin Wall Kimmerer calls our predicament of species loneliness, a deep unknown sadness stemming from the loss of relationship. Extinction events in the Anthropocene and our species loneliness stem largely from the objectification of the non-human environment. What Berger calls commercial exploitation of, of certain species a formulation that kind of chimes with an orientation that Martin Heidegger once described with the term the stand or standing reserve in his essay on technology. Heidegger describes this orientation as enframing or gestel 
which renders the world into a stockpile of objectified raw materials that can be then exploited. My question, of course, is how do we leave aside these objectifying orientations that enframe the environment with deleterious effects for both human and non-human beings? How do we imagine possibilities for flourishing multi-species relationships and communities? And in fact, this will be the burden of my reading of a Ministry of Utmost Happiness. <clears throat> but still staying with the more theoretical framework. Two formulations from animal studies, dull edge, edge of extinction and making kin, helps me explore the violence in treating the environment and species as mere bestand, our standing reserve, and to imagine possibilities for the flourishing of multi-species community against the poverty of species loneliness. While extinction is framed in popular literature as a cataclysmic end event, Think, for instance, about the last dodo, the last tiger, or so on. Right? <coughs> it also gestures towards longer processes that involve what Tom Van Duren calls the gradual disappearance of not just a single life form, but multiple interrelated forms of life. Extinction is an entangled process in which one loss impacts many others over a long duration. Van Duren calls this the dull edge of extinction, in which there is a slow unraveling of intimately entangled ways of life that begins long before the death of the last individual and continues to ripple forward long afterwards, drawing in living beings in a range of different ways. To narrativize this unraveling and imagine forms of being in common, Van Duren, along with his co-editors in Extinction Studies, call for story doers, narratives that can help us to inhabit multiply storied worlds in a spirit of openness and accountability to otherness. Narrating storied worlds also necessitate that we attend to complex and entangled processes of making kin. Donna Haraway writes, making kin as oddkin rather than genealogical and biogenetic family troubles important matters. Like to whom is one responsible? What shape is this kinship? Where and where, where and when does it lines to connect and disconnect? What must be cut and what must be tied if multiple species flourishing on earth, including human and other than human beings in kinship are to have a chance. Making kin is not the same as fuzzy or heartwarming notions of interspecies friendship. Haraway's description of this wild category of making kin includes the possibility of contingent queer becomings, what she calls odd kin, and does not preclude the question of violence in relationality. It necessitates a disavowal of affective investments in genealogical, like let's say heterosexual family, the ideas of heterosexual families and stuff, and biogenetic notions of family lineages, and in following the tracks of one's obligations to multiple others in the realm of ordinary life. And I end with my theoretical segment here, and I turn now to Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Let me begin by saying that um, <clears throat> when we talk about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, one of the interesting things, and I don't have my book with me right now, is that if you notice, for instance, the back cover of the book, you'll notice a small inset image by Mayank Austin Sufi, right, the hardcover, where there's a vulture and a sparrow. On the last page of, um, of uh, Ministry of Utmost Happiness, again, that same illustration reappears, right? It's on the last page, just before we sort of exit the, the novel, right? And this kind of made me think a little bit about what were the role of vultures and sparrows in this text. So here's my argument that Arundhati Roy's second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, creates such a storied world in locales scarred by species extinction. <laughs> As you probably know already, that it is an intertwined tale of two cities, Delhi and Srinagar. However, since this particular talk is on species extinction, I'll focus only on the Delhi segments as they deal more with the portrayal of multi-species existence. I further argue that the sprawling world depicted in ministry, and in fact, it's been critiqued for being too sprawling at times, but continues and extends Roy's ecocentric vision as adumbrated in a relatively more in place, the God of Small Things. In her essay on God of Small Things, Arteva Day writes, Minute descriptions of a usually invisible world is typical of Roy's prose style, which places a premium on centralizing the margin. Vade continues, 
Roy's ecocentrism arises then out of her desire for a more ethical humanism. She suggests that violence might be thwarted if only we recalibrate our sense of the crucial and the trivial, of those who matter and those who are expendable. Roy here designs the backwater, and she's talking about a lot of small things. The backwater sphere is an ecological collectivity with alternative organizing principles for interdependence, pedagogy, history, and belonging. Now, there are clear continuities here between Roy's ecocentric projects in God of Small Things and Ministry. The difference between the two novels is that while Ministry begins with an act of mourning the marginalized non humans, both large vultures and small sparrows have now disappeared. This initiating act of mourning for species extinction then becomes the springboard not only for the metaphoric representation of humans who have lost or are losing their foothold in the sheer wall of the future, but also for the formation of a utopian space at the end of the novel, represented by Jannat guest house. And of course, if I'm presenting to Americans, I'll have to translate Jannat as heaven. I'm assuming I don't have to do it here. A safe space for humans and non-human marginalized that comes into being over and around an abandoned Muslim graveyard in Shah Jahanabad in Delhi. Now recall what I said. I said that I was more into how the question of species that we value tell us more about particular sort of human worlds. So what I'm trying to argue here, of course, is that uh, ministry begins with an act of mourning, the disappearance of vultures and sparrows, but it ends, of course, with the form of a multi-species commons, right? And this happens in Janet West House. <clears throat> While ministry, like Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist, begins with the nostalgia for a lost natural plenitude in Delhi, Roy extends this initial evocation of nostalgic affect to consider the impact of extinction events in the era of the Anthropocene and neoliberalism to connect species extinction with the decreasing visibility of the urban precariat and to imagine an alternative ut utopian space of multi-species cohabitation through the portrayal of Janet Guest House. As one of the primary characters of the novel, Anjum says about Janet Guest House, once you have fallen off the edge, like all of us have, including our Biru, who's a stray dog, you'll never stop falling. And as you fall, you'll hold on to other falling people. The place where we live, where we have made our home, is the place of falling people. A space of death, the graveyard, thus becomes the locus for renewal of life and the formation of a commons. Jannat thus becomes an ecological collectivity, and I'm quoting Vardy again, with alternative organizing principles for interdependence, pedagogy, history, and belonging. This movement from a space of death to a locus for renewed life could constitute the linear trajectory of the novel's otherwise sprawling plot. Ministry begins with an invocation of, um, of uh, species extinction. Let me again share my screen, right? Um, uh, with an invocation of species existence. Um, that of vultures and sparrows. Towards its closure, we come across the following poem in Tilo or Tilottama's notebook. The resonant romance between the Malayali Tilo and the Kashmiri militant Musa is a portal to the Kashmir section of the ministry, which I can talk about more during the Q&A, but definitely I'm not focusing on so much. And this is where the poem goes. How to tell a shattered story by slowly becoming everybody. No, by slowly becoming everything. Telling a shattered story is initiated by the movement from a space of death to a space of life and to the exploration of entanglement, becoming everybody and becoming everything. Human and non-human selves, otherwise lacking footholds in the sheer wall of the future, are given refuge in the vibrant multi-species community that is general. No wonder then that the last scene in ministry features Gui Kyom, which is dung beetle in Kashmiri, as an important constituent of this project of renewed world making in Jannat. The rest of the article will go in three phases. I'll first begin by talking a little bit about the extinction of vultures and sparrows in India, right? Then I'll talk about the metaphorical valence of vultures and sparrows in the plot of the of ministry. And then finally, I'll move on to the formation of the multi-species commons in Jannat. So let me begin my first section, which is titled Multi-Species Communities, Losing Vultures and Sparrows. Here's the opening coda. 
from the ministry, right? <clears throat> ministry begins with an, in it, an arresting coda that to a large extent narrates the extinction of white back uh, vultures or gyps bengalensis from Indian cityscapes. And this is, let me read this out again. At magic hour, when the sun has gone, but the light has not, armies of flying foxes unhinge themselves from banyan trees in the old graveyard and drift across the city like smoke. When the bats leave, the crows come home. Not all the din of their homecoming fills the silence left by the sparrows that have gone missing. And the old white-backed vultures, custodians of the dead for more than 100 million years, have been wiped out. The vultures died of diclofenac poisoning. Diclofenac, cow aspirin given to cattle as muscle relaxant to ease pain and increase the production of milk, works or worked like nerve gas on white-backed vultures. Each chemically relaxed milk producing cow or buffalo that died became poison vulture bait. As, vult as cattle turned into better dairy machines, vultures' necks began to droop as though they were tired and simply could not stay away. Silver beards of saliva dripped from their beaks and one by one they tumbled off their branches dead. Not many noticed the passing of the friendly old birds. There was so much else to look forward to. An important moment that positions, sorry, again. Um, this is an important moment that positions ministry as a reflection both on neoliberalism and Anthropocene. Is this reference to diclofenac and the connection with bovines? Bovines, despite their veneration as Gomata by the hardline Hindu right, are treated as bestand, not sentient animals, but dairy machines. Their cyborg bodies, chemically relaxed, and nodes in a new, neoliberal production line geared towards the sat satisfaction of increasing consumerist needs. This view of animals as best done is a contributory factor to our species' loneliness in the Anthropocene. Mention of the Anthropocene, of course, conjures images of the most evident impact of anthropogenic activity impacting the planet, which is climate change. But the Anthropocene is more than just climate change, as I mentioned. Jennifer Wenzel writes that the Anthropocene involves multiple human-induced changes to the Earth system, resulting from rearrangement of molecules and life forms across the planet, associated with the burning of wood and, and fossil fuels, industrial chemistry, planned and accidental discharges of nuclear material, and global trade and migration. The key point about the use of diclofenac is the molecular rearrangement at the level of bovine corporeality. This rearrangement leads cows to be mere bestand to be milked by humans. But this molecular rearrangement at the level of bovine corporeality has a dark underside. For vultures, among the largest flying animals in the world, diclofenac worked like nerve gas. Tom Van Duren, who has considered the case of vultures in the region extensively, writes, in vulture bodies, diclofenac causes quite painful swelling inflammation and eventually kidney failure and death. Today it is thought that 97% of the three main species of vulture in India, Indicus, Bengalensis, and Tenu, uh, tenu rostris are gone. <clears throat> Vultures, beings that gesture towards an inhuman dimension of time prior to the Anthropos, Anthropos which is custodians of the dead for more than 100 million years, are almost wiped out. So effectively, vultures have been in a way exist, existing in this planet prior to human presence, but they've almost been wiped out. There, there's a vulture crisis, for instance, in India. However, besides the big vultures, the other avian entity entities in this passage. Ministry begins with scenes of leaving home, flying foxes, and the homecoming of crows. But the crucial element is what happens after the corvid or the crow homecoming. Not all the din of their homecoming fills the silence left by the sparrows that have gone missing. The din of the crows or the corvid homecoming cannot replace the silence in the wake of the disappearance of the sparrows. <coughs> this blink and miss reference to sparrows, one of the most ordinary of urban animals, may seem insignificant. If we do not consider the illustrations, like I mentioned earlier, on the last page and the back cover of ministry, just as we exit the plot, we notice a small illustration done by Mayan Austin Sufi in the, type, in the style of Mughal miniatures. This image is repeated in the back cover. Inset in these illustrations is a perch vulture and a sparrow about to take flight. 
The extinction of vultures and sparrows opens ministry. A visual representation of these disappeared avian figures close the text. What do we make of this double invocation of species loss, both narrative and visual, at the beginning and the end? The answers, I suggest, lie in the material impact that species life have on extinct life worlds, and also the metaphorical significance that animals like vultures and sparrows have in the text. So let me begin by talking about vultures. Polyvalent metaphorical associations have always circulated around vultures. Since scavenging is viewed as a debased activity, vultures have often been associated with filth and greed. This association is also evoked in ministry at one point when um, Azab Bharatiya says, Bharat mein gadhe, gid, or suar raj karte hai. It means India is ruled by monkeys, vultures, and pigs. Concurrently, the mention of friendly birds reminds us of cultural religious figures in South Asia, like Jatayu in the Ramayana, an avi avian figure who's associated with nobility and wisdom. On a material level, though, the disappearance of vultures has had ripple effects in multi-species communities in India. Vultures traditionally dispose of the carcasses of livestock. In doing so, they not only efficiently disposed of carcasses, but also halted uh, <coughs> the spread of diseases like anthrax. The high acidic content in vulture stomachs are natural destroyers of pathogenic organisms. Moreover, what was once the task of vultures have now fallen on other scavenging species like stray dogs and rats. This has led to a significant population explosion in such species. The increase in stray dogs increases the risk of zoonotic diseases like rabies, while rats bring in the danger of plague. Not surprisingly, it is the rural population and the urban poor who are more at risk to such zoonotic outbreaks. Vultures have existed symbiotically with humans in India as well. Randuran writes, the mass death of vultures as having economic impacts on some of India's poorest people. These people, often simply re referred to as bone collectors, have made a living gathering the dried bones of cattle and selling them to the fertilizer industry. In the absence of vultures, these bones have now been incompletely in scavenged, requiring either extended periods of time before collection or for people to collect the bones themselves. While Van Duren successfully shows the entangled pathways of humans and vultures in a multi-species life world, this passage is where the limits of his vision are exposed. What he fails to mention is that the bone collectors belong to Dalit communities. Caste, of course, remains an absent vector in his analysis. So let me begin again by talking about the representation of caste, which of course will go back again to Ministry of Utmost Happiness as well by giving you a quotation a couple of quotations from a few uh, from a few uh, Dalit autobiographies right this is Hazari a bone collector who was born and grew up in a village in Moradabad in Uttar Pradesh during colonial rule and belonged to the Chamar caste our livelihood came from the work we did in town cleaning the market disposing of dead animals as regards the dead animals, we watch in the same way as the vulture watches. There is no difference between the vulture and the sweeper in this respect. As soon as an animal such as a cow, go horse, or goat died, we brought it to the field to skin it. We took the meal for cooking and eating, and the skin went dry to be sold. We left the carcass for the vultures to clean, and when the vultures had finished, we collected the bones which we sold. And here's Daya Pawar. The author of the path breaking Marathi autobiography Baluta, he belongs to the Mahar caste. News that an animal had died in the wilds did not take long to get to the Maharwada. It would pass along faster than the telexes of today. When the vultures and kites began to circle like aeroplanes, the Mahars would locate the fallen animal. They would rush to get there before the birds picked the carcass clean. How many vultures? 50 or so. Their wings flapping, they would make strange sounds. Anna Bhav Sate has compared vultures to the velvet jacketed sons of money lenders. If you throw a stone at them, they'd flap and move away a little bit, but their greed drew them back to their body. They probably hated the Mahars. After all, we were snatching food from their claws. 
Let me begin with two disclaimers. My first intention is not to conflate heterogeneous expressions of class of oppression together. The second thing, of course, is my exploration, of course, of caste and uh, the interspecies proximity to vulture has to be thought of with the background of a form of environmental racism or what Joel Lee calls environmental casteism in minds, which in a way forces humans and animals to live together in particular types of locales together as well, right? The point though is that in this, a certain kind of interspecies relationship is also shown. And this is what I wanted to point out. In Hazari's passage, vultures are viewed in terms of their affiliations with humans. Vultures and the bone collectors are presented in a relationship of symbiosis. In Pawar's passage, the, the relationship between vultures and humans is ambivalent and tense. While the symbiotic element is present, vultures almost become a form of media. Note the reference to telex and aeroplanes. The avians and the humans are directly in competition for the same resources. Vultures orient the communities towards the presence of carcasses, but they also replete with negative metaphorical and anthropomorphic associations. They were like the velvet jacketed sons of money lenders, would move when a stone was thrown at them, but would greedily circle back for the spoils. Vultures and humans make kin and go back to Haraway's concept that this is not necessarily a kind of fuzzy concept, but they make kin in a relationship of interspecies com competition over scarce resources and the ever present possibility of violence. Now let's cut to a real incident, which is referred to, of course, in the ministry as well. On July 11, 2016, Vashram Surveya, along with his brother Ramesh, his cousin Ashok, and relative Vichar were skinning a cow in Gujarat's Una district when they were accosted by Gorakshaks, who accused them of killing the cow. The video of their public flogging went viral and forms part of an escalating pattern of violence by Hindutva forces against Dalits and Muslims in contemporary India. Incidentally, India's nearly 12 billion leather industry is heavily reliant on Dalit and Muslim labor. India is also a major exporter of beef. The Una violence sparked massive protests, eventually forcing Narendra Modi to condemn it after a substantial amount of time had passed. Reporter Maya Prabhu for the Al Jazeera visited one of these skinning fields necessary for the leather industry in Chamaria Para in Rajkot in Gujarat. This skinning field full of animal carcass, carcasses is a typical Sokra, and I quote from her, her essay, from her article, and is the most apocalyptic place I've ever seen. Hundreds of stray dogs swarm the rubbish embankments and wade hip deep in a sewage lake to cool off. Years ago, there would have been vultures wheeling on up grass, perching on sun blanched rib, rib cages. A horde of vultures would pick a bull's carcass in half an hour, say Chamaria Para's old skinners. But India's vulture population has been in crisis since the 1990s, so the carcass dump is a grim exhibition in stages of decay. Now, the attribution apocalyptic emerges from a caste privilege that Prabhu herself enjoys, insulated from such locales and activities that Dalit communities have performed or have been exposed to for a long period of time. Crucial here is the depiction of the skinning field as a necropolitical ecosystem, replaced, replete with filth, such as sewage lake, and animal forms that represent death and squalor, stray dogs and vultures. The description of the apocalyptic exhibit of decay notes the disappearance of vultures and the impact of their disappearance in this entangled life world. Earlier, vultures wheeling on updrafts would pick a carcass clean. Their absence mourned by skinners means that the skinning field appears like a veritable museum of horrors for the upper class, upper, upper caste, upper class observer, a grim exhibition of various stages of decay. Now, while Diclofenac has been largely attributed for the disappearance of vultures, the reasons for the disappearance of sparrows or the passer domesticus indicus is a subject of debate and controversy even now. Like vultures, sparrows are ancient birds. Kim Todd writes that a sparrow ancestor begins to radiate out from the African tropics into India a million years ago. Sparrows have also been sporadically found in the fossil record in India for over 100,000 years. Perhaps very few species, domestic animals apart, have co-evolved with humans like the sparrow. Over the last two decades, there have been reports of declining sparrow populations in many states in India. 
A 2015 study lists the, pop the possible reasons for this decline. The introduction of unneeded pet petrol, which produces toxic com com compounds such as methyl nitrate, use of pesti pesticides in agriculture, effects of electromagnetic radiation from cell phone towers, eradication of agricultural land, loss of nest nesting site due to changes in urban building design, competition among other species of birds, and um, uh, competition in, among other species of birds, uh, declines in insect populations as a result from increase of monoculture crops and the replacement of native plants in cities with introduced plants. So one could say that uh, neoliberal urbanization has impacted the food supply of elf sparrows for virtual feeders or voracious feeders. Moreover, straw, an essential component of sparrow habitations, has become scarce. Sparrows also used to roost and nest on tiled and thatched roofs, architectural aspects that are disappearing in contemporary uh, urban structures. <clears throat> in 2008, Time magazine named Mohammed Dilawar from Nasik in Maharashtra as one of its heroes of the environment. Dilawar kept track of the sparrow decline in Nasik and was responsible for building wooden houses for them. He began a Nature Forever Society, which is responsible for spreading awareness about sparrows and help design strategies to conserve them as an umbrella species. In a 2010 interview with the Hindu, Dilawar laments the exclusive focus in India on conserving, on conserving charismatic spe species like, like uh, tigers and ignoring small ones like sparrows. Comparing sparrows to the figure of the Aam Admi or the common man in Indian democracy, Dilawar says, even though the common man, his problems and his welfare is at the center of the idea of democracy, he is always ignored. The same is the case with house sparrows. It's only ignored because it's common. It has little glamour as compared to other species. There's little awareness with regard to the ecological role it plays. Now, Dilawar's comments about sparrows being too common takes us back to familiar reactions to this animal that has co-evolved in proximity with human beings. Sparrows are a very signifier of commonness, some lying somewhere between the status of nature, wild, and culture, which is domestication. Kim Top writes again, in a world fascinated by the predatory and breathtakingly beautiful, the sparrow is a type of the common and the humble. There's something generic about it. Picture the basic bird, the stripped down super efficiency model, and a sparrow probably comes to mind. The Hebrew word that gets translated into English sparrow means bird in general, particularly a twittering one. The root of the old English spirwa means splutterer. Its Latin, Latin name passer was adopted as the root of passerine, the name for the largest order of birds. This attribution of commonness exists in other languages as well. In my first language, Assamese, sparrows are called ghor sirika or gon sirika. Sirika means small animal, ghor means house, and gon means thick, dense, or regular. All attributes of fecundity, commonness, and ordinariness. Maybe one of the reasons it possesses little glamour as compared to other species. However, the sense of insignificance can be deceptive as sparrows can also be invasive species. Indeed, the sparrow has often been treated as a symbol of pestilence, urban ills, and unwanted immigration. They have played a key role in the disappearance of local species. Oftentimes, they are treated as vermin and pests, compared to avian rats. One of the most notorious instances being Mao Zedong's war against sparrows as one of the four capitalist pests, the other ones being mosquitoes, flies, and rats, that needed to be eliminated. Historian Judith Shapiro writes that Mao's order was an instance of environmental authoritarianism that had a massive and negative ecological impact. Designated as capitalist animals who did not work to eat the grain produced by the hard labor of the peasantry, Sparrows were killed en masse in the latter half of the 1950s. But the extermination of sparrows had unanticipated effects as besides grain, they also consumed insects. Locusts and other insects destroyed crops in the following seasons, and this became a contributory factor to the Great Famine in China between 1959 and 1961. Similar fears have also been evinced about the disappearance of sparrows in India. Since they serve as easily available food for bird of prey, a decline in their number also leads to a decline in the population of predatory birds. They also play a major role in dispersing seeds, thus impacting agriculture. 
the dull edge, edge of extinction, which is Tom Van Duren's concept, rears its head again as the loss of one species has its ripple effects across a, uh, across a life world. Geographers Jennifer Walsh and Jody M. L. write, animals have been so indispensable to the structure of human affairs and so tied up with our visions of progress and the good life that we have been unable to fully see them. Their very centrality prompted us to simply look away and to ignore their face. Let us return now to the last sentences from the opening coda of the ministry. While this segment refers specifically to the disappearance of vultures, it also applies to the humble ordinary sparrow. The linear teleologies of, of progress and development in biopolitical modernity impels us to look forward at the seemingly arrow-like progress of time. Everywhere animals disappear, but their centrality prompts us to simply look away and ignore their fates. This looking away is accentuated by the ordinariness of animals like sparrows that exist largely as background noise. But the zoopolitical or politics about animals also bleeds into the biopolitics, biopolitical, which is the politics of life in ministry. Animal extinction is entangled in intimate ways with people rendered disposable and invisible. So I turn now to my second section, which is titled Disposable Humans, the metaphorical bleed between species exi ex existence and precarious human. <clears throat> I begin this section by positing that ministries bleed between the zoopolitical and the biopolitical is not a simple comparison between humans and states of animalization. Instead, instead human-animal metaphorization in the novel operates at two levels. First, the dull edge of extinction reveals the severe impoverishment of multi-species of life worlds over longer durations, like I've already mentioned. And second, it shows how a connection between the disappearance of species and the status of disposable humans who are marginalized in the neoliberal city. As a Delhi novel, Ministry's representational itinerary gestures towards the increased gentrification of the city and the erasure of its surplus people. These de developments occurred alongside the clamor to make Delhi a world-class city. The significant event here is the Commonwealth Games held in 2010. This period led to a massive investment in infrastructure, including the oper 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 operationalization of the Delhi Metro, <clears throat> massive rise in consumption patterns, increase of automobility, and the gentrification of property, which included the proliferation of shopping malls. Another dimension that grew prominent in the period post-liberalization was the rise of what sociologist Amita Baviskar calls bourgeoisie environmentalism. Judicial activism against problems like pollution prompted by upper middle class citizens aimed at the enhancement of elite lifestyles. This tendency has been congruent with banishing the city's working class population out of sight, their labor available yet invisible. This occurred in various ways, such as the closure of hazardous industries, the layoff of workers, and the demolition of slums. Leonard Patra writes, the legal and aesthetic pollution caused by the working class settlements in the factories, according to the idea of bourgeoisie into environmentalism, denied the citizens, read property owners, their legitimate rights in the city. So the idea of reclamation of the rights of the citizenry got directly linked to the dispossession of the working classes. Around 1 million people were displaced in Delhi between 1998 to 2000. The resettlement colonies were little more than planned slums, lacking basic amenities and located near hazardscapes. The Bolsuar resettlement colony, for instance, is right next to a landfill where toxins leak into groundwater. Furthermore, the evictees could end up either losing their livelihood or incurring more expenses in commuting from their resettlement communities, colonies to their places of employment. Now, the first connection instituted between falling people and urban avians in ministry is in the politics of visibility. To extend burger, everywhere animals and people disappear, but they are hardly seen. Commenting on Roy's nonfiction, Rob Nixon writes that she critiques the populist visual rhetoric of nationalism, a visual rhetoric one might describe as fusing the technological sublime with the sacralizing of spectacle. The critique of the sacralizing of spectacle is evident in ministry when Roy focuses on the anti-corruption protests of 2011 spearheaded by Anna Hazare, referred to bombastically as India's second freedom struggle. Most of these protests were held in a popular space of gathering the area near the medieval era, era observatory, Jantar Mantar. 
These protests, as we know, were widely covered by television media, but the area near Jantar Mantar was also the locus of other protests by what Roy calls falling people, like the slum dwellers, political dissidents, and victims of catastrophe like the Bhopal gas disaster. The narrator of ministry describes the convergence of the protests of the association of the mothers of the disappeared from Kashmir, occurring simultaneously with the sacralized spectacle of India's second freedom struggle. And I quote from the novel, no TV camera pointed at that banner, not even by mistake. Most of them engaged, most of the, those engaged in India's second freedom struggle felt nothing less than outrage at the idea of freedom for Kashmir and the Kashmiri woman's audacity. These simultaneous protests are willingly ignored by participants in the epic linear temporality of progress uh, underpinning the second freedom struggle. Notice what happens in the coda. There's so much to look forward to. The following people of various hues becomes part of background noise, easily ignored, much like the extinction events that initiate the ministry. Ministry also makes specific comparisons between falling people and sparrows and vultures. Recall that Dilawar compares sparrows to the Ahmad brief of Indian democracy. Incidentally, a figure rooted in the middle class that has a long representational history, from the iconic cartoons of R.K. Lakshman to the formation of the populist Ahmad party. But while the semantic range of common man can be capacious, what ministry emphasizes is that populations that have lost their precarious foothold on history fall out of this history, of this category, and begin occupying a different world. This distinction is established towards the end when the denizens of Jannat travel across Delhi. And I quote from the novel. They glided through dense forests of apartment buildings, past, past giant concrete amusement parks, bizarrely designed wedding halls, and towering cement statues as high as skyscrapers. They drove over an, imp an impossible to pee on flyover as wide as a wheat field, with 20 lanes of cars whizzing over it, and towers of steel and glass growing on either side of it. <coughs> but when they took an exit road off it and saw that the world underneath the flyover was an entirely different one, an unpaved, unplanned, unlit, unregulated, wild and dangerous ones, in which buses, trucks, bullocks, rickshaws, cycles, handcarts, and pedestrians jostle for survival. One kind of world flew over another kind of world without troubling to stop and ask the time of day. The division of the neoliberal city into these two worlds that existed on separate lanes is anticipated in chapter three when one of the major characters, the hijra or the intersex Anjum, stares into the TV camera and says, we have come from there, from the other world, Dusri Dunya. This chapter goes back to the gentrification of Delhi prior to the hosting of the Commonwealth Games. In that summer, Delhi, the narrator says, a thousand year old sorceress was for forcibly refashioned. In the midst of the celebratory din surrounding neoliberal gentrification, aided by bulldozers, and I quote from the novel again, that could flatten history and stack it up like building material, millions of urban precariat were being moved, but one knows, no one knows where to. Surplus people, not the common man dear to Indian democracy, were losing their access to the commons. The comparisons with the sparrows is explicitly made here, and I quote, on the city's industrial outskirts, in the miles of bright swamp, tightly compacted with refuse and colorful plastic bags where the evics, evicted had been resettled, the air was chemical and the water poisonous. Clouds of mosquitoes rose from the thick green ponds. Surplus mothers perched like sparrows on the debris of what used to be their homes and sang their surplus children to sleep. The plight of these surplus children, resettled in the toxic hazardscape at the margin of the city, at Dusri Dunia, is compared via simile to the plight of sparrows precariously perched in the new metropolis. Both population sets are victims of neoliberal gentrification. The disappearance of sparrows serves as a mirror to the invisibility of the surplus people. Vultures are linked to the representation of caste, especially through the portrayal of Dayachand or Saddam in the novel. In her essay on the Ambedkar-Gandhi debate, The Doctor and the Saint, Roy writes, the utopianism that Ambedkar is charged with was very much part of the, the tradition of the anti-caste movement. The poetry of the Bhakti movement is replete with it. Unlike the nostalgia-ridden mythical village republics in Gandhi's Ram Rajya, the subaltern Bhakti saints sang of towns. They sang of towns in timeless places where untouchables 
would be liberated from ubiquitous fear, from unimaginable dignity, and endless toil on other people's land. Ministry has one major Dalit character who moves from a village named Badshapur, neighboring Delhi, to the capital city, Saddam Hussein or Dad Chand. Dad Chand takes the name Saddam Hussein after seeing a viral video of the former Iraqi ruler stoically facing death. Dad Chand moves to Delhi because his father, who belonged to the Chamar caste, was lynched for the crime of killing the carcass of a, crow, of a cow. Much like the surveyors of Una, Skinning the carcass of a cow puts vulnerable Dalit and Muslim lives in their great risk. Later, as denizens of Jannat in, in indulge in some flannery at the swanky Nando Mall, Saddam or Dachand reveals that the mall has been constructed on what used to be wheat fields and a road where his father was lynched by vigilantes. The link between caste violence and neoliberal gentrification is explicitly instituted. Moreover, as a controlled postmodern space, the mall signifies a hub of species loneliness, a great distance away from the multi species life world described by Hazari and Dayapar. Furthermore, vultures and their role as visual olfactory media, highlighted in Power's passage, comes back to a repeated mention of smell in ministry. Let me take a detour through Maya Prabhu's essay first. She writes again Chamaria Para is signposted only by the stink. Part rancid, oily ram's wool, and part rotting meat, the odor hangs diffused in the air along the shale alleys and thickens at the open doorways of ramshackle warehouses. Anthropologist Joel Lee argues that caste functions as a spatial sensory order, very often predicated through a foregrounding of the olfactory sense. He uses the term olfactory map to describe how in urban and rural caste geographies, odorants operate to, to underscore the sensuousness of space and the spatiality of sensory perception. For the Savarna Prabhu, the stink is a spatial signpost that alerts her to Dalit presence at areas of residence. But as the essay proceeds, smell orients the Savarna subject away from these sources, right? This is different from the way in which Pawar in Baluta and Dachan in ministry describe how they find dead carcasses. The stink orients them towards the carcass. We find the dead cow easily. It is always easy. You just have to know the art of walking straight into the stink. The upper castes, however, are all, all hold their noses because of the stink. The phenomenologies of smell predicted, predicated on caste location orient subjects to olfactory sources differently. As Lee demonstrates in the last part of his essay, such instances of living close to malodorous landscapes are examples of environmental casteism that have negative effects on the health and psyche of the residents. In ministry, Roy's comment about disposable people precariously perched like sparrows refers to this form of slow violence. However, the olfactory also plays a subversive role later as Sting becomes a sub subterfuge to smuggle Kilo and the foundling infant Uday Jabin from the eyes of the police. Dachan says he would come with a friend who drove a pickup for the municipal corporation of Delhi. They had to pick up the carcass of a cow that had died or burst from eating too many plastic bags at the main dark garbage dump in house Khas. It was a foolproof plan, he said. No policeman ever, uh, ever stops an MCD garbage truck. If you keep your windows open, you'll be able to smell us before you see us. And of course, plastic, the cow's stomach bursting out because of plastic or discarded plastic is another way of thinking about the Anthropocene, which is also sometimes been called the Plasticine, as plastic does not kind of degrade even for a long period of time, right? In multi-species communities where humans and vultures once lived in proximity, smell may possess a different valence from the way it imp impacts an upper class, caste or middle class inhaler. The upper caste subjects act of holding their noses, not only a mode of orienting themselves away from biological matter, but also a way of marking differences between a pure notion of cells as opposed to the polluting presence of the caste other. The implication is that the sticky objects of disgust and pollution make the subject turn away. However, from the obverse angle, the same stink is used as a guerrilla tactic by the Dalit character as he navigates urban space. This action also leads to a crucial plot twist as a new restoried world, a thriving multi-species community in Jannat, comes into being as the infant Miss Jabin 
is smuggled under cover of night and stink. Miss Jabin becomes a beacon of hope and futurity at the end. So the act of smuggling her under the cover of darkness and stink leads us directly to the novel's utopian closure. And I get to my last portion of the essay, which is about Jannat, making kin multi-species community in ministry. <clears throat> in an interview with Ratik Asokan in The Nation, Roy says, the sprawling structure of the ministry, it's almost like looking at a city whose plans are ambushed. It has unauthorized colonies and illegal entries. People come together in such places. In a city, you can't walk past a person without wondering who, or she, who he or she is, whose plans are, whose, uh, all these people have stories. They come from different places, and this allows them to share their experiences and create a form of solidarity that would not exist in isolated villages. <clears throat> a bourgeoisie environmentalism and the desire to make Delhi into a world-class world city necessitates forms of rationalized exclusionary planning. Places of gathering like Jannat ambush such attempts at standardize, standardization and urban beautification. What elevates ministry from a stereotypical, compassionate look at the fates of surplus people who are animalized and brutalized is this attempt at imagining a utopian form of being in common that offers lines of flight from and spaces of refuge within the spatial apartheid of the neoliberal city. Moreover, the distinctive feature of Jannat as a utopian space is that it is a locale where humans and non-humans make kin. By the end of the novel, Jannat becomes a refuge for other falling people, which includes sexual minorities, castaways, political dissenters, various injured or abandoned creatures, including dogs, goats, and crows, and Tilo and, and Miss Udaya Jabin hiding from the law. If falling people become part of easily ignored background noise during sacralized spectacles in popular spaces of gathering, like Jantar Mantar, Jannat represents an alternative space of gathering under the radar, radar of the bourgeoisie who shrilly scream about progress and world class cities. In such alternative spaces, ruined, vulnerable, and broken lives are salvaged and cared for, like the injured crow that Saddam or Dayachan takes care of. Furthermore, Echoing Haraway's point about Odkin, Jabin, Jabin's family is a quintessential queer collectivity. It's not what you call the biogenetic or ge genealogical notion of the heterosexual family. Jabin's parentage is revealed at the end. Her mother, Maser Ebati, was a brutalized Naxalite cat catter who had most likely been killed. Her father's identity remains unknown, probably one of the security personnel who had gang raped Ebati. But Jabin now has a family full of fallen people. This is not your stereotypical restitution of heterosexual coupling at the closure, but a queer and contingent collectivity who make kin. As they read Revati's letter, the narrator says, each of the listeners recognize in their own separate ways something of themselves and their own stories, their own indo part, in the story of this unknown faraway woman who was no longer alive. It made them close ranks around Miss Jabin II, like a formation of trees or adult elephants, an impenetrable fortress in which she, unlike her biological mother, would grow up unprotected unprotect and loved. This queer collective would protect Jabin like a formation of trees or a herd of adult elephants. Through these arboreal and animal similitudes, ministry gestures and alternative forms of making skin beyond biogenetic genealogies. Polyvalent, arboreal, and animal metaphors are in, in, intricately woven with the portrayal of this former space of death. We get a brief glimpse of the decrepit graveyard from Tilo's perspective just after her return from Kashmir. When she goes to reside there years later with Miss Jabin, she could no longer recognize it because it was no longer a derelict place for the forgotten dead. The reason for the makeover of the space of death is Anjum, who after her exit from Khwabga, the living space of the Hijras, lives for months in the graveyard as a ravaged feral specter out haunting every resident's jinn and spirit. Anjum moves there because of the trauma she suffered from being a witness to the Gujarat riots of 2002. Her transition from a form of death in life to a renewed sense of life is initiated by a vertiginous shift of perspective where she almost becomes like a tree. And I quote again, she lived in the graveyard like a tree. At dawn, she saw the crows off and welcomed the bats home. At dusk, she did the opposite. Between shifts, she conferred with the ghost of vultures that loomed in, the high, in her high branches. 
Our ravaged spectra communes with the ghosts of extinct animals. Their absence is like the lingering pain of an amputation. These ghostly communions and her sense of herself as a mayfil, a gathering of everybody and nobody, of everything and nothing, slowly transports her back to the realm of the living. When Imam Ziauddin asks her for funeral rituals for hijjahs, she retorts with statements rich with symbolic and intertextual resonances. Where do the old birds go to die? Do they fall on us like stones from the sky? These statements take us back directly to Sophie Mole's questions in God of Small Things, besides, of course, referencing the death of the friendly vultures, which very few people had noticed. As Anjum returns to the domain of the living, she begins squatting in the graveyard. She builds a one-room tin shack in the graveyard, keeps adding rooms to this rudimentary structure, and rents it out to people who had fallen off the grid. With the arrival of Dachan, Jannat begins functioning as a funeral parlor, with a, criteri uh, with, uh, with a criterion that the funeral services would only bury those whom the graveyards and the imams of the dunya had rejected. Not only living people or ancient people who had fallen off the grid, but also dead people who did not belong to any grid whatsoever. Non-human inhabitants like the stray dog Biru, a beagle who had either escaped from or outlived its purpose in a pharmaceutical testing lab, and Comrade Lali, a red-headed mongrel who gave birth to five puppies, and as a mother was a great friend of Tilo's, also live in Jannat. The, uni the uniqueness of this multi-species dunya with multiple modes of making kin is signaled to Tilo when she first moves to Jan Jannat with Jabin. Anjum spoke as if it was a world that Tilo was familiar with, a world that everyone ought to be familiar with. In fact, the only world worth being familiar with. If the dunya outside Jannat had grown exclusionary, this Dusri dunya was a new form of world making. The graveyard had turned into a Noah's Ark of injured animals. The soil of the graveyard, a compost pit of ancient provenance, had become a thriving vegetable garden. Tilo began a people's school. A new common came into being. One of the most important symbols of utopian hope that gesture towards alternative futurities in the novel is the infant Miss Udaya Jabin. Hannah Arendt in The Human Condition famously writes that action has the closest connection with the human condition of natality or birth. The new beginning inherent in birth can make itself felt in the world only because the newcomer possesses the capacity of beginning something anew. If mortality is a central category of metaphysics or philosophy, natality is a political category par excellence as it is oriented towards, ex towards action. It is unsurprising that many global cultural works use birth and natality and the promise of what is called reproductive futurity as the herald for hope and the possibility of a new politics, especially during the moment of closure. Ministry follows this utop utopian narrative script where Miss Jabin ties up many of the significations, cross-hatching the deployment of terms like life and death, simultaneously facilitating the gathering of a queer collectivity. Miss Jabin, who grows up in a graveyard, is named after another Miss Jabin, Musa's daughter, who was killed in a protest in Kashmir and lies in another graveyard in Srinagar. At one point, Musa says that in Kashmir, the dead will live forever and the living are only dead people pretending to be alive. Musa's comment about living in Kashmir as a state of entrapment in an eternal present and of death as a mode of escaping and surviving beyond the state of occupation is relevant to current necropolitical states in the Indian occupied state, often figured as Jannat in the Indian imaginary, which has now become a graveyard. Conversely, the graveyard in Delhi's Sajanabad area becomes a space of life, whereas Tilo says, the battered angels in the graveyard that kept watch over their battered charges held open the doors between worlds illegally, just a crack, so that the soul to the present and the departed could mingle like guests at the same party. Life became less determinate and death became more conclusive in the space of multi-species gathering. But reproductive futurity does not have the last word in ministry. Sticking to her ecocentric vision of entangled human non human lives that range from the biggest animal to the most minuscule being, Roy ends with an image of Guiko, Kyom, the dung beetle, wide awake and on duty, lying on his back with his legs in the air to save the world in case the heavens fell. Entomological study shows that the humble dung beetle may be actually saving the world by potentially reducing the scale of global warming by aerating cow dung paths. 
Dung beetles have a major impact in the reduction of methane release into the atmosphere. Guicom, defending the world with his legs in the air offset by a miniature image of sparrows and vultures watching like guardian angels. And I quote from the novel, maybe things would turn out all right at the end. This I suggest is Roy's powerful ecocentric imagining of a multi-species being in common. Conjuring forms of entanglement, being in common and making kin in marginal spaces. Worlds, works that imagine making kin like ministry assist in re-symbolizing our relationship with the planet. Such re-symbolizations move us away from instrumentally viewing the non-human environment and the human population categories as mere bestand and also help us imagine possibilities of being and existing otherwise. Thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go over my time. I do open this up for questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You were very much on time. And uh, thank you for introducing such a brilliant and beautiful topic. Uh, it was a new angle, actually, that you gave to this novel. Uh, because here in India, uh, we were looking at this novel only in terms of what we very well know about the political volunteerism and the political activism of Arundhati Roy. We were not looking at the novel with this very unique and a very novel angle. So thank you very much for this very unique and introducing this very unique and novel angle. Uh, before, before Saket go ahead and take up a few questions, if there are any, uh, I have just one small little query. I don't want to say, call it a question. It is just a small query that uh, uh, since Arundhati Roy in this novel has introduced so many themes, so many issues, right from, uh, I, mean, I mean, Kashmir and militantism, and then uh, the Dalit uh, conscious, and then uh, that very unique angle that you gave to this novel. So this introduction of so many themes all together blended in this novel. Uh, don't you think that she was returning after a very long gap to writing fiction? Mm -hmm. And she returns with a fury that uh, she was ready to amalgamate and mix up a lot many themes and, and a lot many concerns in one novel altogether. So is it, is it being a professor of, 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 of uh, literature, uh, is it good enough for a writer to blend so many themes together? I'm, 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 I mean, I'm asking this question with a student point of view because we have a lot of students here and we talk about theme and form and style and everything, right? So what is your take on this amalgamation of so many themes together? And isn't it so that uh, um, um, uh, Arundhati Roy was in a great fury when she was uh, taking up all these things in this novel. So. Sure, that's a very good question. And uh, thank you for asking it. Um, one of the major critiques of the novel, and I don't share that critique, but I, I mean, I'm just talking about my own kind of engagement with these ideas as well, is that it, as opposed to, let's say, the relatively tight form of God of Small Things, something like Ministry of Utmost Happiness definitely seems far more sprawling and open-ended. And many people have seen that as a fault or, or as inadequate, or I've even read articles that say that, you know, her nonfiction voice kind of predominates over her fictional voice, right? And in many ways, if you've been following what she's been writing ever since God of Small Things, a lot of that definitely comes in into the novel as well. So you could say that, you know, the nonfiction that she has was kind of like a preparatory ground for the writing of this novel overall. So that's one view. That's one view, uh, which I think wants to kind of take this question of artistic form within a relatively tight structure, right? Something which is unified, something which is focused and so on. And invariably, Ministry of Utmost Happiness falls short when you see the economy with which she plots, let's say something like God of Small Things. I disagree with that. And one of the reasons I disagree with that, of course, is that I think there are other ways to which this novel could be approached. There are three that, let me say that there are three. First of all, I think one of the things that she wants to do is to write a type of all Indian novel, which has become kind of, uh, if you think about the whole trend in Indian writing in English, 
especially in the last 30 years or so. Whereas some things like Midnight Children, we're trying to narrate the nation in a particular way. Gradually, we have moved away from that. This is not Midnight Children, but this is her own take on what we could call the novel of the nation, right? So, but she, this is not the novel which is narrated from the center. She takes multiple kind of peripheries and stitches them together. So it's a patchwork. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is something that I briefly hinted, I think, in my talk. And this comes out from her interview. I found that very fascinating, is that she compares the sprawling structure of her novel to the sprawling structure of a metropolis or a city. That the spatial arrangement of the, of the novel is like what you could call the spatial arrangement of a city itself, with its numerous bypasses and so on and so forth, right? I find that interesting in the sense of how, for instance, you could read this as a kind of novel about urban space itself. And not just a novel about urban space, as a novel that even mimes the question of urban space to its very architecture, right? So that's the other aspect that I say that, right? The third one, and this is where my reading comes in, is that I find it interesting that it opens with species disappearance, it ends with the dung beetle, right? It ends with the formation of a multi-species being in common. So I do think there is an organizing principle in the novel, even though we don't quite see it, right? So there is a way in which the sprawling structure is a larger sort of vision, which goes to various concentric circles. You could say, on the one hand, is the question of the nation. I mean, that's one circle you could think of, right? You could think of it from the, from the standpoint of cities, I mean, wonderful papers could be written on it just in terms of navigation of Delhi or Srinagar as these spaces, I think. I mean, I know of one paper that I'm that a person has written for a special issue on the Anthropocene that I'm editing, which is on Srinagar as a solid space. So I think there is a way in which you could read this as a urban space. Thing. But I think there's a larger dimension to this as well. And this is where she's bringing you into times which almost in some sense exceed that of the human. Right, And that's why the Anthropocene, what the Anthropocene, if you think of the Anthropocene as yet another narrative where the human becomes the dominant species in the planet, I, I'm not very interested in that sort of reading, right? What I'm more interested in is that the Anthropocene actually opens us up as a species among many in a larger ecosystem, that we have been here only for a certain blip of time. If you think about it from geological time scales, the time of the Anthropos is very, very limited indeed, right? But what vultures and sparrows do is that, or, or what species extinction do, does for that matter, is that it opens itself to inhuman dimensions of time, times before the human themselves. Vultures have been there before the humans have existed. So it has sparrows, so to speak, right? So they are constitutive parts of a larger ecosystem, which is now under collapse. What are the costs of that? And I think that's the larger ecocentric vision. And that's where I would find a principle of unity in this novel overall. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Saket? Saket? Hello? I think his voice is echoing. Do you want me to address some of the questions in the chat? There are some questions here. I think Gunjan Chaturvedi has asked a question about motherhood, and then we can keep on coming back from there. Or yes, sir. yes, sir. Saket, Saket, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I can point. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I can. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I can. Uh, I can point question, sir. I can. Uh, I can. Uh, the question Saket, is coming. Saket, shayad, shayad, perhaps online from two sources. So, ek ka mai kha. Now it is okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, there is a question, sir. Uh, I can find by Dr. Gunjan Chaturvedi. Uh, the question is, uh, please comment upon the exploration of parenthood, more specifically motherhood in the novel. That's a good question. Um, I mean, if you think about it, I've thought about the question of motherhood or even parenthood in this novel, not from the question of stereotypical kind of heterosexual family relationships, but more contingent relationships. If you think about it, 
on the one hand, Anjum, right, at different points of time, does act or does act like a mother. First, I keep forgetting the name of the character at the beginning of the novel, but then she does become a mother to Uday Jabin at the end as well, right? So there's a way in which she sort of acts as a mother throughout. There's, of course, Tilo, who acts as a mother, for that matter, to um, <clears throat> to uh, Uday Jabin. And then, of course, there are these kind of missing mothers in a certain way, right? The, the mother of the original Uday, of, of the original Jabin who was also killed there. There's Masih Rebati, who's probably also killed or for that matter, who exists like a Naxal elsewhere and so on. So I think the way in which this novel actually represents parenthood is through the lens of contingency. It's through the lens of what we can call contingent becoming. When we talk about family, um, especially when we think, for instance, about family genealogies, those that come from, let's say, fathers down and so on, these are almost naturalized as certain forms of progression, so to speak, in some ways, right? What queer collectivities, like what we see, for instance, in Ministry of Utmost Happiness, queer families, what I call queer families in, in Ministry of Utmost Happiness does, is that it actually talks about notions of becoming rather than being. Because when we talk about, like, let's say, classic naturalized models of families, very often we are talking about roots more than anything else. And this is at the at the base of what we call the, the notion of being itself, right? However, what we see in Ministry of Utmost Happiness is what we can call a gathering of people, a becoming, a processual becoming of a family, something that contingently comes together. And that's what fascinates me more about what happens in Jannat at the end, that it is a queer collectivity in that sense. It is not quite a biogenetic or a gene genealogical family. It is making kin as odd kin, right? This is the concept of Donna Haraway that I began with. It's making kin as odd kin. And this does not include only humans. It also includes non-humans because you also have comrade Lali, for instance, with her puppies, right? Who kind of acts as kind of like a, a companion mother figure to Tilo as she's raising Uday Jabin as well. So you have the animal figures there as mothers as well, so to speak, in some way. So it's more of what I call this notion of becoming rather than being more than anything else. This is not so much, as I said, one of the biggest critiques that it, this makes about a certain form of nationalist metaphysics. And we go back to people like Anne McClintock, who said that when you talk about nation, very often it is figured within the idea of the national family of man, right? The notion of the national family of man. This is a very famous thing, right? And in fact, this is a way in which we definitely talk about like brothers and sisters in the family or, or you know, brothers or sisters in the nation and so on. The, you know, your notions of filial uh, formation definitely come in. But I think the capaciousness of something that comes at the end of Ministry of Utmost Happiness and what fascinates me is this mode of making odd kin, these contingent connections, which are not necessarily nation bound, which are not necessarily community bound and are not necessarily species bound either for that matter. So it's a sort of multi-species collective in that sense. Um, yes, sir. Um, I can find uh, one more question here by Primli Saika. Mm. Uh, sir, will it be justified to say the reading of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is a bit less realistic in comparison to the God of Small Things? Well, that depends on how you would like to define the term realism itself, because if you think about it, God of Small Things has many passages, especially in its evocation of nat natural landscapes and so on, where it almost seems, if you think about it, to get into the realms of fantasy, or at least the way in which a kind of landscape, a natural landscape, appears to the fantasy world of children. So it kind of focalizes it through the mind of a child, so to speak, in some ways, or children for that matter, right? So definitely in that sense, you already have a mixture of what we can call um, a realist novel, which is already tinged with other kind of genre registers. It's, that's there in God of Small Things itself. Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Now, one of the things you could say, of course, is that the beginning at least seems very magic realist with with, with something like, uh, you know, with, with, with Anjum, for instance, in the graveyard and so on and so forth. Actually, if you ask me, my take on Ministry of Utmost Happiness is that it's ultimately more realist and allegorical in mode 
then God of small things. So instead of calling, I would go the other way around. I would probably say that while God of small things kind of stretches certain boundaries of realism, right? I would say ministry of utmost happiness is actually more realist in its form than God of small things. It's actually more allegorical and realist in its form than God of small things. Of course, notions of chance meetings, notions of, let's say, magical elements definitely enter there. But in terms of its canvas, I find it far more realist than, say, let's say something like God of small things. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh... Anyone else who, uh, who want to ask any question or ha uh, has is having any observation? Okay, I think no one, sir. So uh, uh, I request uh, uh, Professor Ashok Das, sir, uh, to uh, come up with the vote of thanks. Das, sir. Uh Am I audible, Saket? Am I audible, Saket? You are, you are audible, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all present. In today's Wave Interaction Series, Academy, organized by the Department of English, Karim City College, Damshedpur, it has been a very rewarding experience to hear Amit Rahul Bashya. Associate Professor, Department of English, Oklahoma, on the topic A Foothold in the Sheer Wall of Future, Species Extinction, and Making Keen in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, a novel by Arundhati Roy. In today's time, nothing could perhaps be a better choice than the topic the novel and the novelist that Professor Vaishya preferred to choose and deliberated upon. He has very brilliantly and logically and insightfully held the mirror of the novel before us to realize, to feel why this extinction of species are taking place and what are the opportunities or chances for survival of them lies in future. But it has also got a metaphorical undertone in the gradual process of extinction of, extinction of mankind and uh, in what way the, we can look forward for survival of humanity and human values in the days to come. Kudos to Professor Bashya for his exploration and convincing presentation of how the novel and the reference could provide a foothold in the sheer wall of future. Again, it has got figurative, I mean, symbolic connotations. He has also very finely described how various themes have been yoked together, not by violence, but with ease, and how this sprawling structure of this novel has been a very useful tool in enabling the novelist to convey uh, the theme that she wanted to place before us in this novel. Thank you very much, sir, for your such a good, brilliant, and insightful lecture, which has been very much beneficial for us and rewarding for us. I, on behalf of the Department of English, Karim City College, Jamshedpur, express reverence and thanks from the core of our heart to Professor Vaishya to be present amidst us this evening and to enrich us with his profound deliberations. Thank you, sir. I also thank all the faculty members and students of our college and of other colleges and universities as well, and all other members of the audience who have been present with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Amit, sir. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much for inviting me. This was oh. lovely. Um, and I think one of the benefits of this pandemic is this rise yeah, of yeah, online. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I said this is my eighth one this year overall yeah. to different universities in India and Pakistan and, and Bangladesh. So it's been good to actually interact with people even though I'm here. <laughs> <laughs>